Okay, I think it's time to get started. Good afternoon, morning or evening to all of you. I am Deed Entenheer, Secretary General of the Zaga Consortium, and it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to this Zaga Summit on Sustainable Lighting for Smart Cities and Building. Sustainability and circularity will be at the core of our thinking. It is already maybe now, but it will be even more so for the years to come. And therefore, it's really great to see so much interest in this summit that we've organized uh, for you. On a personal note, some years ago, I read the publication Towards the Circular Economy of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And that's been really a source of inspiration. There it is put forward that modularization, standardization is one and one of the important pillars for circularity. And it's exactly this topic that we will explore today. And it's exactly because of this close link between on the one hand circularity and the other hand modularization and standardization that we believe that Zaga has a role to play here. And we have excellent speakers today to, uh, to deep dive on what I just uh, superficially tried uh, to introduce. Um, before we do that, we have some housekeeping topics. So we have muted everybody in this webinar had to avoid some uh, the background noise. We do invite your questions and comments. And please use the chat function for contacting the organizer on technical issues, but use the Q&A function for your questions and comments on the topic of today, circularity and Zaga. Each session will be followed by a panel discussion where the moderator will pick up your questions and questions not addressed will be compiled and answered by mail. And there's one question that you need not ask as the Zaga Summit recording and presentations will be made available after the summit through the Zaga website. Okay, turning now to the first session of today, we have found Aneta Kelso of Signify willing to moderate the session. And Aneta already many thanks for that. Aneta has worked for Philips Lighting and Signify for 34 years in both the UK and at the head office in Eindhoven. And during that time, she has held a variety of roles involving sales, business development, product and marketing management in the European lighting market. And she has been, and that's of course most important today, a member of the Zaga Promotion Working Group since its start in 2010. And it may very well be that Aneta is the most Zaga senior person today in the audience <laughs> and in the panel. But any day, without further ado, Aneta, I would love to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Day. Um, great to be here uh, and to uh, kick off with the first session. So it's a, the first session will be all about the regulations and opportunities for the lighting industry in the field of sustainability and circular economy. And we have the four speakers that you can see here from diverse backgrounds with whom we're going to explore this topic from different angles. So in the next hour, we'll hear from representatives of the European lighting industry, Elena, the Green Light Alliance, the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the Zaga Consortium itself. And at the end, there'll be a short panel discussion, which will try and address some of the questions and the major themes that uh, arise. So I'd now like to introduce the first speaker. And that is Elena Scaroni. Elena is the policy director of the European Lighting Association, Lighting Europe, where she's responsible for policies related to sustainability and the transition to LEDs. Elena has a long track record of working with the European Parliament on policies related to environment, climate and energy. And in her role at Lighting Europe, she has led the advocacy work on behalf of the lighting industry on the latest eco-design regulation for light sources in the legislative debate between the European Commission, the Member States, the European Parliament. So I'm delighted to give the floor to Elena, who's going to give us an overview of the key sustainability policies that are currently being debated in the EU and how they will impact lighting. So over to you, Elena. Good afternoon to all of you. I will now share my screen. Hopefully the audio works as well. Voila, so the topic today 
is sustainability requirements, uh, uh, upcoming sustainability requirements for the lighting industry. So I will try to give you an overview uh, as exhaustive as possible. First of all, uh, what is Lighting Europe? Lighting Europe is the European association representing the uh, lighting manufacturing industry. We also represent the supply chain and our members are displayed here in these slides. In this slide, you see also, of course, uh, Signify and, uh, of course, uh, associations and other direct companies. Contents for today, first of all, as I mentioned, we'll try to give an overview of the upcoming sustainability requirements. What are we doing in Lighting Europe uh, in this regard to prepare for that? And then uh, we'll give a short summary of the latest rules that have been approved uh, by the EU institution and are now applicable. So when it comes to the sustainability requirements, First of all, I think you have heard about the EU Green Deal. The EU Green Deal is one of the flagship programs of the European Commission and uh, a number of initiatives are announced there. Some have been already tabled, uh, some others are uh, expected soon. Um, we would like to talk to you today about one of them in particular, the Sustainable Product Initiative. This is a legislative proposal that is expected at the end of this year, is expected for adoption by the Commission on the 14th of December. And what it's all about is about, in particular, the review of the Eco Design Directive. And the Eco Design Directive, you know, is the framework directive that regulates a number of products, including lighting, and sets uh, a number of uh, uh, minimum requirements, in particular on energy efficiency. Not only uh, a legislative proposal on the Eco Design Directive will be proposed, but also a few other uh, files will be part of a package. We expect a legislative proposal on consumers' empowerment, so on consumers' rights. We expect also a legislative proposal on how to substantiate green claims. So how to make sure that companies declare in the same way, in a comparable way, um, their environmental declaration. Um, when it comes to products that will be impacted, it's not only about the usual eco design products, including lighting, but many more will be in the loop. We expect in particular textile, furniture, uh, steel and cement to be included. But how the lighting industry will be impacted? We expect a number of changes you need to make to your uh, production uh, and your, your way of working in your company. So first of all, you will be asked to design your product according to new requirements that will be uh, about um, how to make your product upgradable, repairable, durable, and how to enable remanufacturing you will also be required to uh, comply with a number of rules on materials. So, for example, we expect rules on recycled content. So, uh, a percentage of recycled plastic should be included in your, in your product. Uh, we also expect a number of new information requirements that we, not only you, but also your supply chain will be uh, required to supply and to enter in a new database. New packaging for sure will be needed with new information, new QR code, new labels. Um, we also expect uh, uh, the energy labeling rules to be changed, to be revised according to these new uh, principles. In particular, it's possible that the energy label will include information on repairability via a repairability score. Also, um, rules for reporting uh, will be revised and sustainab sustainable activities will be required to be uh, reported uh, by companies. Voila, so just to go a bit uh, deeper on some of these upcoming requirements, so to give you a more concrete idea of what to expect. Uh, we expect, as I mentioned, 
requirements on how to design your product and also rules on how to inform about your product's um, characteristics. We expect, for example, information on commercial warranties. We expect uh, you to be required to inform about the repairability, reliability or failure rates of your products. For example, this could be done via this repairability score that I just mentioned. Um, information may be also required on durability. Uh, this is not maybe for this first stage, may, maybe a later stage, uh, a durability label could be introduced. So after repair score, maybe a, a durable score will be uh, introduced as well. When it comes to our products, in particular on lighting, uh, we expect that uh, at uh, um, let's say uh, SPI level, sustainable product initiative level, we expect a number of horizontal minimum requirements, but then the most stringent requirements will be set in legislation at product specific level. We also expect some uh, new rules on, on, uh, on labeling to adapt to these new uh, requirements in eco design. Another topic where we expect uh, new rules and you to adapt to uh, new requirements uh, is uh, in the field of uh, uh, carbon environmental footprint. As I mentioned before, we expect uh, a legislative proposal on how to substantiate green claims. So the Commission is still discussing how to address this topic, how to harmonize, harmonize rules, how to make sure that uh, companies declare information and this information are clear and comparable. We expect something uh, in particular for eco-design products, so products that are already in the eco-design framework. Uh, we expect that the consultants will probably tackle all these products uh, together. Um, the consultant on the eco-design work plan that is also on the review advised to ask a standardization entity to come with the methodology and uh, a, standardiz a standardized format to, to report this information. I mentioned before that also uh, a new database will be created. Uh, this is called what is meant as a digital product passport. So products will have a passport, which means uh, should be able to provide a number of information for consumers, for surveillance authorities, and also for the other industries in the supply chain. So not only you as manufacturer will be asked to provide this information, but also your colleagues from your supply chain, and you will get access to this information via a QR code. Uh, from the discussion we are having uh, at, with the Commission, we expect this uh, aspect, this digital product passport to play a central role uh, in this sustainable product initiative. And uh, for example, we expect this uh, registration to become mandatory uh, to place a product on the market. So before you place a product on the market, you will be required to register this product in this uh, uh, new database, as it happens today with the April database. What is Lighting Europe doing in this regard? Uh, first of all, we are discussing uh, these uh, items in, uh, in Lighting Europe, of course. Uh, we are drafting a position on these uh, requirements, so to be ready to uh, uh, discuss uh, these proposals with uh, EU institutions, because please bear in mind that a Commission proposal is expected now in December, but then the European Parliament and the governments of the Member States will be also asked to provide their inputs and to propose changes. So then not only the Commission will be involved, but also uh, hundreds of uh, members of the Parliament and also um, 27 member states. Um, what are we doing in terms of also uh, consultation? So uh, the Commission has opened a number of uh, stakeholders, consultations and uh, stakeholder meetings. We are involved in all of them so that we are able not only to provide our views, but also to listen and understand everything that uh, is uh, boiling. 
Um, of course, we also have direct contact, not only via these formal meetings, but also in informal conversation with the members of the commissions. For example, tomorrow we have a conversation on the repair score uh, with members of DG Environment to understand what to expect uh, for lighting. Um, we are also discussing these items with our peers, and we also uh, already uh, promoted some joint actions together. Um, for example, a joint letter has been made on how to review the Eco Design Directive. And of course, we are ready then to engage with the Parliament uh, in particular. In this last part of my presentation, uh, I will provide an overview of what are the new rules that have been introduced by the Eco Design Regulation that just uh, became applicable on the 1st of September. So, first of all, uh, this is also part of sustainability. A number of products are phased out by the eco design regulation why because the eco design uh, products are all required to contribute to the eu targets on climate and energy uh, towards 2030 so lighting is called to contribute and how phasing out uh, products that are considered not enough efficient um, and voila, so we have, for example, CFLI are phased out already from the 1st of September. Uh, others will also be uh, phased out in 2023. What is interesting to know is that these products are also regulated by another legislative file, uh, which is the ROS, uh, ROS legislation, which uh, regulates uh, hazardous substances like, like mercury. So products that contain mercury are regulated by this uh, legislation and a number of decisions are expected by uh, the commission on on the fate of these products. Um, some drafts have, have been made by the Commission and they are setting a different timeline <laughs> compared to what is here in this table for eco design. And now scrutiny is about to start in the Parliament and in the Council. I will try to give you a very quick uh, summary of the uh, so-called circular economy requirements for lighting. Uh, I mean replaceability and removability in particular. So first of all, the eco design regulation is not addressing luminaires alone and light sources, but all products containing light sources and control gears. And first of all, is setting a replaceability requirement. So all products containing light sources and control gears should enable replaceability of these components. But this requirement is in some way softened by, softened by a, a, a clause that says that if there is a technical justification why this replaceability is not possible, then this requirement in some way doesn't apply. But so this means that you have to clearly justify and explain why this replaceability is not uh, um, achievable. In our guidelines, as you know, light, as you probably know, uh, Lighting Europe uh, um, has made a number of guidelines to guide the industry uh, on these requirements, uh, particularly on eco design uh, labeling and the April database. We help you um, implementing this, these requirements with examples and diagrams. Uh, the second most important uh, um, and most important requirement uh, for light sources and, and uh, containing products in the uh, eco design regulation is the one on removability. So containing products should enable removability of the lights and control gear for verification for market surveillance authorities. If this is not possible, then your products, so your luminar, for example, will be strongly penalized and consider a light source. In this case, all requirements for light source and, and uh, um, in terms in particular of labeling, but also efficiency requirements will be applied. We have a number also of information requirements that should be displayed on the product. And Lighting Europe has prepared a number of pictograms to help you implementing this, uh, these rules so that you can easily use and display on your products. 
In our uh, guidelines, as I mentioned, we also have diagrams to help you, guiding you what is my product? Is this a containing product? Is this a light source? I need to know. So your diagram can help you. What to expect for the future? As I mentioned, we expect new rules on how to repair a product or information uh, requirements on the repairability, for example. You need to know that some of these rules are already in other legislation for other products in eco-design. So in particular, uh, the uh, refrigerator, dishwasher, and these uh, other products, they have very strong requirements in terms of instruction for repair so that need to be provided or also very short timeline for providing spare parts. So please keep in mind that these requirements will can come uh, soon uh, for lighting as well. Not only from the SPI or the eco design uh, for lighting, but also maybe in a a parallel file, another file, this one on empowering consumers in the green translation transition. Just to conclude our uh, overview on our current guidelines on eco design, energy labeling, and April. So, eco design, energy labeling, we are already at the fourth edition, just published now at the end of June. And even uh, later, we have published the April database second edition. So, these uh, guidelines are available, available via our website. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. That was very informative, very comprehensive, and well done for getting all of that uh, fitted in in 15 minutes. I'm sure we're going to come back to a few of these topics in the Q&A. So I'd like to move on and introduce the second speaker to you. The slide. Yeah, uh, Elena, could you maybe uh, stop sharing? Right, then I can uh, share my screen. <laughs> Good. So in the meantime, I would now like to introduce you to our next speaker, which is Reinhard Lechler. Reinhard has a long and distinguished career in the lighting industry, starting in 1990 with Osram, where he was previously head of development for electronic gear with responsibility for several European design centers. He's currently responsible for Osram's standardization and regulations in the digital systems division and chairman of the technology steering team in the lighting association of ZVEI. Now, Reinhardt's going to address you today in his capacity as chair of the Zaga steering committee. And he's going to talk to you about how Zaga addresses sustainability and the circular economy, the concept of circularity lighting and problems to be addressed and solutions that could possibly be offered by Zaga. So over to you, Reinhard. Yeah, many thanks, Aneta, for that kind introduction. So I would like to ask uh, Dee to give me the rights to present. You should be able to share your screen, uh, Reinhard. Yes. Oh. So can you see my screen already? Yes. Yes, thank you. So as you can already see from the title of my short presentation, I would like to explain how the work of the Saga Consortium impacts and interacts with sustainability and the circular economy in the lighting sector. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say a few words about the Saga Consortium itself. It is an open global industry consortium in the field of lighting with currently more than 350 member companies. These are divided into regular associate and community members. The regular members are shown here in the slide and uh, they shape the content of the consortium's work in the members meetings. So the results of this work uh, are interface specifications for components of LED luminaires. These standards are also called books at Saga, and you can see a selection of visuals of these books here. Examples are uh, book 18, which describes the interface between an outdoor luminaire and a communication or sensor module, or the book 23, 
which describes the quite well-known analog LED set interface between LED modules and control gear. And book 26 for replaceable linear LED modules is currently in progress. So if one deals with the topic of sustainability, one very quickly comes across the essential work of the United Nations. A report by the Commission on Environment and Development states, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without comprising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development, there are 17 basic sustainable development goals and 169 targets that explain how these 17 goals are to be understood. They are targeted at governments, NGOs, but also at companies, associations, and private initiatives. Important aspects are, amongst others, of course, to counteract climate change, to conserve valuable resources, and to minimize environmental pollution. Here you can see four of these sustainable development goals that have a particular relevance in the field of lighting. It's number 12, responsible consumption and production. Number 13, climate action. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Or number three, good health and well-being. I would now like to move on to the topic of the circular economy. On the website of the European Parliament, the following definition can be found. It is a model of production and consumption, which involves sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing and recycling existing materials and products as long as possible. And in this way, the life cycle of products is extended. I think from that it is obvious to conclude that an increasingly mature circular economy contributes significantly to the achievement of sustainability goals. What does all this mean for the lighting sector and how can the circular economies be supported in the lighting sector? So I see luminaires in particular here uh, that are durable, repairable, upgradable, future-proof, and have replaceable components. These luminaires, we can call them also serviceable luminaires, and how can these above mentioned characteristics of serviceable luminaires be achieved? So I think it is very important that the luminaires are modular. It is very important that their components work together properly. That means that they are interoperable and that their interfaces are based as far as possible on internationally recognized standards. Ideally, there is a rich ecosystem of interoperable luminaire components offered by many manufacturers. So this is where Saga comes into play. The Saga Consortium focuses on the development and standardization of interface specifications for interoperable components for serviceable LED luminaires. Saga is thus part of a set of rules and that support and promote the goals of the circular economy. Some regulatory requirements with the same goal are already in force on a predominantly regional level, and we expect more to come as already described by Elena. Other market requirements are also conceivable in this area in the future. In this context, 
Zaga uses the term circularity lighting to depict a market framework of standards and regulations for products and systems that support the aims of the circular economy through enhanced serviceability. Sustainable lighting is more a general term and includes the properties of circularity lighting next to supporting energy efficiency. In the following, I would like to address a few problem areas where Saga specifications offer fundamental solutions. First, luminaires, especially for outdoor use, and connectivity solutions have very different life cycles. While street lights are often in service for 30 years or more, connectivity and sensor technologies can change in a few years and open up completely new possibilities. Saga Book 18, for example, describes specifications for intelligent interfaces between outdoor luminaires and sensors or communication modules and allows these functions to be decoupled from each other. Sensor and communication modules can be selected independent from the luminaire and may be added or exchanged at any time. A second problem area can be that electronic products are subject to a statistical risk of failure. Even high quality and durable control gears, LED modules or lighting control devices can fail at some point of time. For outdoor luminaires in particular, it makes sense to be able to replace defective electronic components, not only in terms of material efficiency, but also from an economic perspective. The Saga books 24 and 25, for example, enable contactless programming of replaced control gears using uniform NFC readers, even on site. Furthermore, the replacement of defective LED modules is supported by the specifications of books 21 and 26, which also play a role in the following problem. There are many situations in which it may be desired to adapt or upgrade the product properties. For example, a different color temperature may be desirable due to a changed use, or the efficiency of a new and more modern LED module may already be so much higher than that of the old and used one that a replacement is worthwhile from an economic and ecological point of view. The ecosystem created by Saga Books 21 and 26 allows the selection of modules with desired characteristics. For example, the efficiency or the color temperature or the CRI or others. Now I come to a conclusion. Sustainable lighting systems are energy efficient, durable, can be repaired, adapted and upgraded and do not contain any harmful substances. A modular approach based on standardized component interfaces makes luminaires serviceable and creates the conditions for an efficient circle economy in the lighting industry. Circularity lighting refers to a market framework with products and systems that support the aims of the circular economy through enhanced serviceability. The Saga Consortium focuses on the development and standardization of interface specifications for interoperable components for serviceable lead lumens. Saga also offers a certification program. This results in a rich ecosystem of luminaires and components which work together across the manufacturer base. With that, luminaires become serviceable repairable, upgradable, future-proof, and sustainable. At this point, 
I would like to refer to our <clears throat> new white paper, how Zaga addresses sustainability and the circular economy, available on our website, www.zagastandard.org. Many thanks for your interest, and I pass back to our moderator, Aneta. Thanks very much for that, uh, Reinhardt. I think that you, uh, you've you characterized very well what this, one of the strands that the Zaga Consortium is working on at the moment with sustainability and circularity lighting. And I think it raises many uh, issues that we will touch upon again in the, uh, the Q&A in uh, a few moments. So thank you very much for that. So now we will move to our next speaker, our third speaker, Emilio Hernandez. Emilio is a lighting designer and one of the several founding members of the Green Light Alliance, and he's the current chair. After 15 years of working as a lighting designer on a diverse range of projects in different sectors, Emilio has recently moved from London to Sweden, where he has co-founded a new company which focuses on developing and promoting sustainable lighting design values needed for a net zero carbon future. So Emilio is going to talk about his vision for sustainable lighting design and will touch on some of the opportunities for smart luminaires and lighting design to evolve and adapt together with circular economy principles in mind, as well as highlighting some of the different legislation and metrics on the circularity of a design that are being explored in our industry at the moment. So the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes, Emilio. Thank you very much, Anessa. I'm just gonna share my screen. Let's see that. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, as Anessa mentioned, the Green Light Alliance is uh, its role really is to help everyone understand their role in the circular economy and promoting it within lighting. We're trying to encourage designers to think of buildings, perhaps as material stores, uh, as well as changing their approach to. Uh, to, to more minimalist design and we're also helping suppliers of lighting to be circular ready as we like to say it through perhaps sharing uh, good circular economy practices and examples um, there's a lot to cover today in a short space of time so it's not going to be comprehensive but we're looking at opportunities as Annette mentioned uh, at smart technology and the transition uh, over to circular economy and whilst I'm not an expert in smart technology um, uh, particularly, I think uh, you know I've got a good litmus for the appetite of this in the industry through the conversations we had in the Green Light Alliance. So this has been my journey through uh, the last year or so in a deep dive into circular economy principles, and I'm sort of currently understanding the sort of scale of this movement and, and the impact for our industry. And it can be a bit overwhelming, um, but if we build a community around this process, I think uh, you know the knowledge and practice can be shared. Um, unfortunately, many aspects of smart lighting and standardization are already uh, really aligned to circular economy principles. So there's a lot of work which has already been done. Uh, so let's look at the circular economy core goals uh, so we can understand how they align with smart tech. So in the short to medium term, we've got a transition period and this needs us to make use of the potential waste that we've already generated. And there's a lot of that um, Rico light load uh, recycled 45,000 uh, tonnes of uh, electric uh, WE uh, products last year alone, and that's only one compliance scheme. Um, and then in the medium to long term, uh, we've got future designs to consider. So we need to change the problem at its root through procurement, not just trying to engineer our way out of this uh, alone. It, it, it needs both sides of these things to change. And we also need to find a way to stop materials ending up in landfill. And this needs uh, a change to the economic models of things. So how can smart cities and buildings uh, help be part of this? Well, smart tech uh, has a huge role to play in communicating product information, fixture health, and retaining value in the product, which ultimately is what circular economy is about, is keeping that value chain as high as possible. Um, it also presents opportunities for a culture change uh, in the design, not just efficiency and waste reduction. We'll touch on that a little bit later on. Um, a luminaire can only be as smart as the lighting project. So there's no such thing really in my view or in, you know, 
uh, as a sustainable product without it being part of a wider sustainable scheme. Um, and I think, uh, importantly as well, open protocol, uh, as Reinhardt mentioned, these are long-term solutions. Uh, you know, to, to, to go circular is a 20-plus year um, plan, and it's going to necessitate uh, long-term adaptable systems. And that's probably going to, you know, through the conversations we've had, it's going to favour uh, adaptable systems. So um, we'll just touch here on the, the linear economy that we see on the left, and uh, Reinhardt already mentioned the, the circular economy, and this is the butterfly diagram, which is from Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And it consists of the biosphere, which is organic matter. It can include things like the food industry. We're focusing on the technosphere. And within that, uh, again, Reinhardt mentioned different systems. So we've got the maintain and prolong aspect of it, which traditionally we understand and we're set up for uh, in a sense, but can still be improved. Reuse and redistribute, which we aren't set up for. And this is the big shakeup really as part of the circular economy and remanufacture and refurbish. And, um, you know, we touched on these uh, these today, but I want to look at the, the movement of these products in different lighting markets and where smart technology is needed to make it happen. So looking at maintain and prolong, uh, this lends itself to owner operators such as Transport for London, perhaps schools, hospitals, churches, and they might traditionally have on-site maintenance teams, facilities management. Now, there's some great new um, uh, sort of initiatives popping up with Stone Lighting for New uh, and Whitecroft with their Vitality Relight, and they're extending duty of care. They're bringing new products to site uh, and to upgrade, uh, and this offers some great uh, opportunities because uh, you know you, you can add uh, add technology to these products to uh, to make them uh, more long term, easier to maintain, and this this can use components with standardized uh, mechanical sizes or photometric things such as Zarka components, but you can also store other data on them uh, to do with their, their life expectancy, their burn hours and beam angles, things like that. So these types of process will add uh, that smart application into these existing projects. Again, in the short and medium term, reuse and redistribute um, is a, a model where smart technology can help. So this lends itself to flexible spaces. So it could be a co-working space. Uh, it could be a large dynamic portfolio, like a retail portfolio. And previously I've worked uh, in a company at Nulty where we worked with Selfridges and they had uh, chandeliers, which they used in London, which they then refurbished and sent up to Manchester when they were having a fit up there. And that type of um, process requires a responsible owner. It also needs a design input, it needs a scheme uh, to use products that are designed to be demountable in some way. Um, and, and, and all the better if there are ways such as task lights or track lights where uh, there's limited expertise required to install these. Smart techs can help with these with things like asset tracking, uh, wireless addressability, which might help with commissioning of spaces if you're moving office or moving products from one location to another. And again, they can install, uh, they can store important criteria on, on that asset and uh, it helps with, with your maintenance and procurement for that space. Of course, there's logistics to be considered, and a lot of the circular economy is about logistics. There's cost in packaging and movement of the product, but we need to consider offsetting that against the value that you ret retain by having a bit of flexibility in these products. Um, and you know, that capex, that initial capex, you make a saving against new installations uh, and new equipment. So perhaps a model for a slightly more long-term application uh, is remanufacture. Uh, and we need to stop the products that we build now will try and be geared up for remanufacture. Now, if we look at type, this sort of splits into two types, uh, but you might have a shorter life scheme um, that involves a variety of manufacturers. Now, this could be a, a hospitality, restaurant. Um, it could be high-end retail where there's a lot going on in the space. Um, it could be a short lease office. And, what this needs in order to work in terms of circular economy is a responsible client or responsible contractor if you're changing what's going on in that space. So again, we're building products now and bearing this in mind and, and Elena mentioned that sort of the, the digital product passport that could, that could include key information about that product's performance that helps the contractor determine the remaining residual value in that product. So that can then be 
reappropriated to a manufacturer. Uh, now there's uh, the Regen initiative and Egg Lightic who have launched uh, some remanufacture initiatives recently. And uh, I think we're going to see a lot more approved third parties that are going to take on responsibility for this type of um, you know, remanufacture of products. Recolite are also launching a scheme called New Lights for Old uh, later this uh, or next week, I believe. And that might involve manufacturers who have got old stock that hasn't been sold, they need space, and they will find a third party that will be able to bring that up to code or find um, a, a buyer or user for it. Now, again, the benefit of, of smart tech here is you might have the known burn time in, in a product that's already been used. Um, Standardisation is going to be key so that, as Ryan Hart mentioned, that um, you know, products can be upgraded and maintained. And, and importantly, with smart tech, you could create a pipeline of potential products that might be coming your way through future strip outs. Anything that can't be reused or recycled, uh, material passport that, um, or digital passport could include red list materials or any, any information on responsibly sourced materials in that product that, that again, retain some of that residual value. And mean that it's it's a, a green product that can go into a a, a, re, a different pile for reuse or recycling. Importantly, when these products go back to market, you're as a manufacturer potentially accessing a different market, a bit more diversity. Uh, you can still perhaps get commission on these types of products. Uh, it's a lower investment from the manufacturer, and um, you know products could be refurbished. Uh, so they you know they, they have some remaining life with an extended warranty, or they could be remanufactured and as new. A slight variant on this model is the type two remanufacture is perhaps large schemes that come from a single manufacturer. Now this relies on the manufacturer itself to be responsible. And an example might be a large industrial fit out, uh, contracts with local authorities, or an office fit out. So again, the premise here is the same, that the products are supplied with the digital passport, which has key information on the product. It could also have information on embodied carbon or greenhouse gas emissions through things called uh, EPDs or energy product declarations. Uh, again, manufacturers are offering take back schemes uh, from their old ranges and they're not, you know, um, they're not taking necessarily all of these back from everything, but they've launched uh, you know, initiatives to uh, offer clients the ability to remanufacture their products if they wish. And it's great to see these products, or, uh, these uh, initiatives already taking place. Now, remanufacture is a tricky process, and, and I know that Trilux have tried it and said that, you know, it's, it's a non uniform process, it's quite difficult to do, but the cost of remanufacture can be offset against virgin material. Um, it's going to be driven by incentives and standards, uh, as Elena mentioned, and uh, there's informational value in old products, which you can't underestimate you know, how you can maybe re-engineer your product to use less material if you get it back from the market and you see where it's, uh, where it's been you know, used and abused and where it's stood up to the test. This is the easiest route for specifiers. Um, it's the lowest risk to the client, but there's a high involvement from the manufacturer needed. Uh, and it may lend itself to different scales of manufacturers. And again, the material passport could contain information on uh, registered materials or responsibly sourced and verified uh, material chains. So we've looked at the, the sort of the product's journey throughout the market, but just to loop back onto how smart tech can also help change the culture. Um, there needs to be a link from smart technology back to the designers and the manufacturers, which, which isn't happening at the moment as we'd like. And this is why we'd like to raise the profile today. Um, information on, on burn hours and failures is, is very helpful uh, from smart tech, but there's also um, information perhaps on were there fewer sick days from the circadian uh, lighting system that you installed in an office? Um, has there been more or less foot traffic through a particular um, street or shopping center? Um, also an increased perception of safety. What are the usage patterns, real time energy and maintenance savings? All of these, um, as well as uh, perhaps an insight into some products that might be available in the future um, from a planned strip out, can go into uh, a design from designers who are willing to, to kind of seek out these, these criteria and seek out secondary life products. As designers, we need to probe the client uh, and their commitment on circular economy. We need to ourselves reduce 
there's an aesthetic uh, compromise to reduce the waste and to reduce perhaps the quantity of product we use, as well as working with our supply chain. We need to look at what's being inherited on a material if it's a, if it's a fit out of a Cat A building where there's some perfectly good lighting in there, would we consider adopting app design to include that? And we need to think about uh, including things like future upgradability in our specifications to capture this detail. It's really important because we can, we can talk about it, but if it's not written in our specification, then it can be value engineered out. And we need to determine a plan to put these products at the end of their life cycle. So that's the conversation with, with the client and it's about changing the brief. So briefs need to and will become more sustainably focused. And the scheme's lifetime, we perhaps on those last four models that we looked at, we can try and understand the best circular principles for that particular client and that project. So lastly, I'd just like to look at tipping the, the balance really. So there's a lot of, points here on the left, which we've come across as, um, you know, uh, considerations for a move over to circular economy. And one is that operational energy for lighting is the, by far and away the most important uh, or, or heaviest use uh, of carbon within the lifetime of product. Uh, standards currently encourage new technology because this in use factor is the largest emission factor and, and newer products are more efficient. But the grid mix is changing and it's becoming decarbonized. And at that point, uh, then manufacture and you know, waste material will be a bigger part of it. We also have a, a, a cultural issue, a commodity attitude. It's a learned behavior about the lack of natural value in, in resource and materials. But uh, a study published by the visual capitalist suggests that copper uh, is going to be too energy intensive to extract by 2050. And so as I mentioned about seeing buildings as material stores, we'll be able to track where these materials are. A uh, study through a uh, third party ISO approved um, platform on a, a Wycroft product uh, showed that 70% of the greenhouse gas emissions on a particular product came through the, the LED and the uh, manufacturer circuit board itself, which is only a, a, a tiny percentage of the overall mass and material use in a product. So how we measure this is becoming important and how we capture that. Um, again, as Elena mentioned, there's going to be a, a, a circular economy British standard. You've got the uh, eco design regulations that have come through the EU Commission with their circular economy action plan. There's funding for smart cities. All of this is going to lean towards, uh, you know, in favour of circular economy. Um, the linear process is undoubtedly more streamlined and very refined and optimised. But unfortunately, it's become a race to the bottom and. There's going to be improved circular economy infrastructures, which is mentioned with companies like Regen uh, and approved third party suppliers and uh, opportunities for urban mining. It's going to become an attractive business plan. Um, local supply chain also gives better environmental oversight. And lastly, one of the complaints is a lack of knowledge. Uh, how do we design for circularity? <clears throat> What's the viability and cost of my business for adopting this new economic? model, it's, it's, a, it's a bit unknown, but again, there's that informational value in taking your product back that helps you better design your product for the future with more standardization, with modularity to enable remanufacture. And then uh, as designers, we need to include this in our specification. So we have a TM66 by the Society of Lights and Lighting. Brianna are looking at bringing in circular principles into their um, uh, you know, standards and then uh, opportunities like cradle to cradle, where there's a very in-depth deep dive into the, uh, the greenhouse gases and embodied carbon in a particular product uh, will become in more demand. And uh, through some of the discussions that we've been having, um, these EPDs or product declarations are going to be needed to tender certain projects and become a ticket to play. So thanks a lot for your time. I've sort of rattled through that. Um, but uh, please feel free to get in touch uh, and have a look at the green light lines. Uh, and we look forward to any questions. Thanks very much, Emilio. You, you've painted a, uh, a picture of the future, which is um, astounding to many, I guess, an awful lot to consider and unravel in your uh, presentations. And I look forward to uh, having the panel discussion. I hope we can uh, make some time for it. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move on to our uh, final uh, presenter in uh, this session and the only one not from Europe. This is uh, Michael Meyer, 
who is a researcher at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, which is one of the US Department of Energy's national laboratories, where he's worked for 14 years on a wide range of lighting projects, including building energy codes, federal appliance standards, commercial building integration, and advanced SSL. And previously, he has worked as an architectural lighting designer in New York. He has a master's from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a BA in theater from Arizona State University. Now, Michael's presentation is going to give us an overview of multiple voluntary programs running in North America by the US Department of Energy and the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, NEMA, which are related or to or similar to Zaga Book 20. So looking forward to it, over to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to uh, intrude on your day. This has been a great presentation so far. Um, and my focus really is on kind of some North American efforts related to voluntary programs that are either based or very similar to Zaga Book 20. Um, I do think it's important as we've been talking about the circular economy and sustainability of moving into this uh, standardization of uh, just the small uh, widget parts to allow for flexibility and interoperability. Um, at least too often in the North American market, many manufacturers uh, try to differentiate and use that as their leverage. And as a downside, you can't replace uh, products or even components very easily if a manufacturer goes out of business or if there's a change in technology very easily and it ends up having to change, in some cases, in the U.S. market a lot, uh, they have to replace the entire luminaire. And, and so I think it's really important that we start looking on these small standardization efforts that seem small at the real mechanical level, uh, but it can have a greater role. So I'll be touching base on, um, as mentioned earlier, two U.S. Department of Energy related efforts, and then one that's somewhat related, um, but very similar to the Zaga program uh, that is occurring by the National Electrical Manufacturer Association. And as mentioned, uh, I am uh, across the pond and all of this is focused on really North American efforts. So the first thing I wanna mention is something known as LPRIZE. Uh, this was actually something that was briefly presented uh, by the Zaga Consortium earlier this summer as well. Uh, they were very nice to host a webinar related to this. So I just wanna mention it again. Um, the idea here is the US Congress uh, incentivized uh, is really uh, many years ago, the uh, next generation lighting competition. And the idea is that there's a financial prize for a manufacturer um, and or practitioners that develop um, the kind of a very far cutting edge technology. Um, and there's a couple of phases. This is similar to if you're pop following uh, US uh, policies or other things, um, the L Prize had a, a standardized uh, lamp or light bulb uh, back in around 2010, that was a competition as well. And there was again, a monetary prize really trying to get manufacturers and uh, technologists to really reach as far as possible in terms of uh, how innovative they can get. Um, so as I mentioned, um, it, it's in three phases. Currently we're in phase one, which is concepts. Then we'll be moving into phase two for actual prototypes. And then finally, we'd like to see actual products installed and validated. Why it matters related to this presentation, uh, this overall conference here is, you can see these are the major consistent technical requirements for LPRIZE. Um, in the US, and I think probably in Europe, we're all kind of getting used to and very comfortable with um, efficacy, high efficacy products. This does try to push a little further on that. Uh, but this also looks at some of these other aspects, such as quality of light. But you also see that product life cycle plays a large role. Um, and in this catalog of, of characteristics, a check mark is a requirement and a box indicates that they can get additional points. So again, uh, designed for disassembly, circular economy, they have incentivized criteria for that, for this next generation fixture. We don't want to incentivize a cutting edge that then just replicates some of the problems we've had on the manufacturing and disassembly side. The other thing that they're offering incentivized points for is this sensor ready and upgradable category. And that's what that's shown in the yellow highlighting. And I blew it up uh, so you can read the points. Here, they're trying to focus on this D4i driver, which is somewhat Dolly uh, or Zaga adjacent, um, uh, but that's something that North American also has an equivalent known as ANSI C137. So we're really focusing on that standardized driver uh, communication and data protocol, but then also they can get one point for luminaires that uh, use the Zaga Book 20. So again, the idea here is there's a financial incentive for manufacturers that really developed a, a cutting edge 
forward looking fixture, but we don't want to leave out these small components, such as how the sensors actually fit in the luminaire and how the day is exchanged. So that's one program that's going on right now, and we'll go through roughly 2024. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is this voluntary program that we're about to uh, announce in the near future. Um, the image on the left is kind of representative, again, of most of the North American market that you can get any kind of configuration of sensor. They often come in rectangular, uh, circular, or kind of some oblong shapes. The challenge is each one is a different size, and that's the problem. And that's ultimately where, you know, Zaga Book 20 comes in and plays a role. So we're, you know, I like this old cell phone analogy as kind of an example of uh, 15 years ago, every time someone had a new cell phone, often the connector base uh, was different, requiring all new types of interfaces. Every time you got a new phone, just generating waste and uh, uh, limiting some of the innovation we can do. And that's where we need to get to in lighting. We moved away from that in, in the mobile phone market. We need to move that for that well as well as we actually have the same problem in uh, computers and PCs. Uh, we really standardized on that in the USB technology and similarly. So there's a history in consumer electronics of standardizing on uh, the same electrical and mechanical interfaces for, which allows for innovation. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do with this, what we're calling the IoT upgradable lighting challenge. When announced, the idea here is to really make controls and sensors more accessible to a broader set of users. So the idea is really trying to focus at that widget level and to really get manufacturers to lean into uh, how hard would it be to them adopt a Zaga 20 type of interface in a standard fixture. Um, in the US, we've also asked for uh, a slight, um, uh, a reasonable price increase and in understanding that it is a slight deviation. So this is kind of how the challenge approach works. We put it out there and ideally manufacturers respond and it's a market pull opportunity um, to demonstrate that there is interest on it by end users and therefore manufacturers respond. Along the way, as we were developing this performance program and voluntary program, we looked at both Zaga 20 um, and then this NEMA document, which is a, actually in the very final stages, they just actually emailed me today. Um, so this is just abbreviated as LSD. This is the, one of their documents. So they have a similar kind of concept of a standardized interface for control developments. Um, many of theirs overline, would overlap with the Zaga shape. Um, this was developed by NEMA manufacturers. So again, that's a North American focus. Um, it does include some out of scope analog sensors. So it has more categories uh, than the Zaga Book 20. Um, and one concern could be that too many or proprietary shape and size sensors may affect future upgradability. So that's always a concern as you get to too many shapes and sizes. Uh, for the challenge that we are uh, going to be announcing rel relatively soon, we surveyed 20 North American manufacturers and actually reviewed over 60 sensors. Um, and some of the data that we Required in the process, we actually supplied both to the Zaga Consortium and NEMA to help them inform their documentation, which we'll talk about in a second. Ultimately, this IoT challenge is going to focus on the four Zaga uh, shapes and then one NEMA shape. This is really more for your high bay fixture. Um, it's a, something the Zaga Book 20 doesn't have right now, but what happens if you have a sensor that actually needs to be outside the luminaire, but still needs to have a standardized interface, and that's one that the NEMA category does. Again, the end goal here is really encouraging standardization and reducing upgradable uncertainty, and that ultimately benefits the entire process and sustainability by not having to change every time you change manufacturers, or worse, even technology. Um, so you're all familiar, I hope, but if not, I'll just touch base on it. Zygo 20 it standardizes on the physical and electrical interfaces, and that's going to be a detail that I'm going to come back to in a second, the electrical and physical. Um, and then there's the shapes and sizes. So I'm going to, and then ultimately has to work with the, the D4i driver um, as well. So that's a kind of the standardized Zygo 20. Um, so this is the, the NEMA version, which again is uh, similar, but slightly different. They're standardizing the physical connection. Um, they have roughly 10 to 12 sensor type options. Um, four of them directly overlap with, with the Zaga standard. Um, where they significantly differ was there, there was a little pushback on a standardized plug connector. So while uh, Zaga Book 20 specified that, and we ultimately think that's a good idea because even though it's two wires, that's still a chance for an error or confusion. So having that standardized wire interconnection, again, uh, makes things easier and just 
it, it makes allows for upgradability. Um, also, the NEMA document do, really doesn't address the D4I driver issues yet, or benefits, actually, I should say. So this is where they are. And as I mentioned, this document is being developed and finalized from what I was told uh, by NEMA uh, quite literally today. And so this should be available publicly, at least in the North American market, very soon. One of the things that was interesting in the process as we interview or analyze all the sensors is we compile lists of 16 North American manufacturers. Many of them also have European counterparts or subsidiaries or even parent companies. We looked at 66 sensors across these North American manufacturers, only focusing on ones that would go in the luminaire that were low voltage or a dolly connection. Um, and what was interesting is that when we looked at and, and held the specifications for the tolerances for the, air, for the areas and the set aside and the keep outs um, for both NEMA and the Zaga document, we found that in the NEMA document, about 50% of the sensors we found uh, were compliant, which makes sense because NEMA is uh, North American focused and Zaga is more international. Um, what was the, the challenging thing, and you can see this over in the right hand image, is this known as the external keep out. So the Zaga standard, as well as the NIMBA run, had a lot limit on how large the sensor could be outside the luminaire. And ultimately that has a really a limited um, impact, negative impact on how the sensor performs. It can cause some line of sight issues or some other parameters, but ultimately that external keep out was actually limiting a number of sensors from complying with either the Z NEMA document or the Zaga document, even though some of their own manufacturers were helping writing this document, some of their sensors weren't even meeting their requirements. If you exclude this keep out, and sometimes we're talking about just a few millimeters difference, um, you can see that a majority of the sensors in, in North America uh, meet both the, the NEMA document and the Zaga standard. So this is a kind of a thing that we're, uh, we supplied to both Zog Consortium as well as NEMA, showing that this one small uh, thing was actually holding up a lot of sensors uh, from complying. And from a technical point of view, it had limited um, impact on, on its importance. So this is the type of information that we do as a national lab that we were sharing, and we actually think it will help inform and improve both of the specifications. The other thing that we're focusing on, and this is a little outside the Zaga, but it's very co-related, is that we're trying to hopefully get the North American market uh, away from the zero to 10 driver. I know in Europe, that's less of an issue, uh, but we have a legacy problem with that technology in the US. So we're requiring this D4i driver as a requirement. Um, again, the benefits there are just numerous. The previous presentation alone showed some of the examples of some of the data that you're gonna need um, and that's coming can come directly from the D4i drivers. So this is some of the things that we're trying to voluntarily get manufacturers and end users to pull the market there to the smarter digital drivers. Um, and then one of the other reasons why we think the D4i driver uh, makes a lot more sense is that really it's a standardization within the luminaire, which is great for sustainability, but allows for a lot of maximization of all the communication outside the luminaire. You can still communicate beyond all those things. And so by focusing on an intelligent driver with a uh, standardized sensor interface, you're really uh, dialing into two major issues uh, while not limiting uh, choices. Um, this is a final slide in case you're wondering what the differences are between these two programs. I do appreciate you letting me uh, really pitch a North American focus thing. So this IoT challenge is really trying to be very close to market. We're only focusing on the driver and the sensor. And at least in North America, we're seeing more D4i drivers available. Um, it's meant to only be really kind of go for one year and, and, and pull that market quickly. Whereas the Prize is really reaching for the future. It's looking for a number of performance aspects, but also uh, circular economy and sustainability, as well as some other equity issues. And so it's a much bigger, farther, harder reach um, so it's a kind of a comparison of a couple of different um, voluntary programs that are currently in North America. This is my contact information. Would love to follow up and any questions or if you have information you could share that I missed. Thank you very much, Michael. I can see that you are racing through that to get to the, uh, the time, uh, <laughs> the slots. But now we're going to uh, start with the, uh, the Q&A and the panel discussion. I'd, li I'd like to invite the uh, four speakers back again. If you can turn on your, your cameras again, that would be great. And we can start having a look at some of the uh, 
the points that have been raised by the audience uh, that uh, you can perhaps give your views on. Uh, I'll start with uh, you, Elena, um, because there was a, a question raised about the time frame for the uh, circular uh, economy requirements that you were talking about. Um, how far into the future would that be? Thank you for this question. So, um, first of all, there will be some, we said, some horizontal minimum requirements that can be set already by this legislation to be proposed uh, uh, in December. 2021, so in a few months. So there you have to calculate 18 months more or less of legislative debate with the parliament and council, and then at least 12 months uh, for having the first requirements applicable. So I would say not before half 2024 for these requirements set, let's say, at the horizontal level. Uh, we expect then, of course, the review of the eco design regulation for light sources, uh, and there there will be very specific requirements for lighting. This, this has another timeline, so we expect a legislative proposal to be tabled by the Commission at the end of 2024. And so, again, one year and a half debate. Uh, so process is a bit different, but still there is a debate with member states authorities and then another year to see the first requirements applicable. So not before, let's say, 2026. Well, OK, thank you. Does that kind of tie in, Emilia, with the vision that you've been sketching of how the whole market is going to change in the in the coming years, 2024, 2026? When do you think, how would you position your thoughts in that timeline? Yeah, you know, it, it's an incremental <clears throat> process, isn't it? I think, um, you know, total circularity is going to be a very hard thing to measure even when, when we reach it. But um, it's a, there, there's these incentives um, to, to kind of have projects meet the criteria before it becomes legislation. If you look back, uh, there's examples of lots of clients, um, you know, the right kind of client and conscientious developers um, doing that already, where you know they they build projects to a certain specification before it becomes legislation. So, I mean, I, I would love it if we could make a dent into in in that time frame uh, yeah. and and have some great examples and case studies uh, to yeah. show. Yeah. Um, the, the picture that you described in your presentation, um, when, I, when I think back 10 years to the lighting industry and how traditional and conservative everybody is and how it was a huge shock to lighting designers in particular that we were moving away from well-known trusted technology of incandescent and fluorescent to LEDs and that, that was already a huge step. How do you think they're going to react to or adapt to the, uh, the vision that you present, which is, is really changing an awful lot more. I, I think it's a, it's a very adaptive industry. I think that it, it's moved away from being a few core key players and that the, the more agile businesses are, thanks to, I suppose, in, you know, in, to, to standardization within the LED industry, uh, are able to, to build products and present their range at the same um, you know, to, to the same type of clients that previously was only available to, to you know, really big suppliers. I think it's a question of, of adapt um, or fail, but I don't think it's the same, you know, from what I showed you, those different options. It's not the same model for every manufacturer or for every project. And as designers and clients and developers and manufacturers, we need to, to understand which one fits best. Yeah. Do you recognize that picture, Michael, that uh, uh, Emilio is, is sketching? Do you recognize that in the US? Do you recognize the EU eco-design uh, direction as well? Uh, well, I was first smiling at yours of, uh, I, 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 I lean more towards you, Anetta, of, uh, I think it's a little slower moving industry uh, steeped in, in a little tradition technology. So I, I, I thought your comments were there good. Um, I would say there's, we're not there as far as the European Union is on eco design. It is moving, hopefully, from in the U.S. from niche to more of a common. It comes up a lot more, um, but um, 
it's not a, at all a standardized feature yet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so not quite on the same uh, page yet. Okay, um, we have uh, some questions from uh, the audience here. So uh, for instance, this one would be to uh, Elena, is the new legislation applicable to lead lights made in Europe? If so, what about imports from outside of Europe? Yes, so I try to answer in the in the chat session. So these regulations are applicable to all light sources and separate control gears that are placed on the EU market and that of course are in the scope of this regulation. So this makes that all products that are placed on the EU market, imported or uh, made, manufactured in the EU, are on an equal foot. So they have to comply the same rules. Is that, would that be the same for online sales, online platforms? That's a very good question. And this is a topic that is uh, heavily debated and discussed in Lighting Europe. So how to make sure that uh, uh, really all products, uh, whether are sale online or offline are um, required to uh, ap apply the same rules. So in theory, the same rules apply, but then in practice, it's possible that some online providers uh, may not comply with all, um, with all rules. So that's a, a very interesting uh, discussion that we are having at Lighting Europe, how to make sure that all products uh, fulfill the same rules. Okay, um, we have another question here from the audience on the relabeling of products is a tremendous effort. Is there a discussion about alternatives such as using certification marks on products that might make it easier? I have to admit, I was a bit smiling about this question because uh, the direction of the EU institutions is exactly the opposite. So uh, not to abandon labels, but to make them uh, play a, a more important role more and more. So they are discussing, as I mentioned before, a reparability score that could be integrated into the current uh, energy label or instead be placed separately on the product. So then you would have two Two labels, one on energy label, if applicable, and one on reparability. Then they are discussing a durability score, which would make another label because again, they want to provide uh, simple to use information. So the, the, the label has been so successful that they want to use it everywhere. So instead of uh, moving away, you will see more and more labels instead uh, picking up uh, in uh, regulations at you level. Okay, thanks. Um, a question to uh, everybody in, in the panel can feel free to chip in here. It, it, it's, it's one that um, is particularly pertinent when you start to talk about replaceable, upgradable, serviceable luminaires. And that is about how, what, what is the manufacturer's extended warranty worth in this case? You, you place a, a, a project with certain type of luminaires in it and with um, a warranty maybe attached to it. Are you still bound by that when uh, the installer changes the components uh, during its lifetime and actually the insides are not so much to do anymore with or not, not the same as they were when they were first installed? Who'd like to uh, give, a, give a view on that? I think it depends on, on the concept uh, and who does this uh, service on the luminaire. For example, if the uh, luminaire supplier himself does the repair or the upgrade, uh, I think it's quite easy. And uh, it could be also a, um, a, a qualified contractor doing this, which is in contact with the supplier. But of course, uh, if if the repair or the upgrade uh, could be done by anybody, so this would uh, imply additional questions. So there have been some rules to be taken here. Anybody else have a view on that? 
I can maybe pick up on this point. So rules uh, on this responsibility are currently um, explained in the blue guide, which are uh, guidelines that have been uh, published by, by the EU Commission to help uh, exactly on how to deal with all these uh, questions and problems, who is responsible for what, uh, when, uh, yeah, um, placing a product on the market and the CE marking obligations. Uh, I would like to say that all these rules are uh, being in some way rediscussed uh, by the, uh, this new initiative. So in the sustainable product initiative, we see that uh, clearly they I would like to address the issue of uh, warranty and uh, also yeah, responsibility of repairers. So who, um, who can be authorized to repair products, um, who can have access to this information. So there's a number of different uh, aspects that for sure will be uh, in some way at least uh, re Revised in this uh, in this review, in particular with this also consumers empowerment legislative proposal. This may set uh, new rules exactly on the so-called right to repair that has been also mentioned before by by Emilio. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um, Michael, there was a question from the audience about um, what what your view would be on closer cooperation between um, Nima and Zaga on the sensor nodes. Do you Thank have you. Uh, on that? Yes, I, I do. I, I also want, I didn't have anything to add on the last question. I thought it was a great question though about the warranty. So I'm glad someone asked it. I learned a lot. <laughs> um, I would say the Neiman Zaga, there's a, and someone actually responded and I would agree with that in the chat. There was a fair amount of overlap. There's definitely European um, cross communication, both between Zaga and Nima, then also the manufacturers. Um, where they're not aligned, I think is somewhat the base of who constitutes NEMA versus the membership of the Zaga Consortium. Um, some manufacturers said, well, this is our shape and they couldn't come up with a, a, a catch-all to make sure it could fit. So it, the NEMA differs at least by one. There's two different shapes that are very unique and that's why there's more categories. Um, the other one, and I don't remember the whole rationale, it was a similar Zaga shape, just different um, uh, tolerances for a smaller size, I believe. So I would say, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but if I had to guess, I'd say there's about a 60 to 70% overlap between the two of them. And, and the really the two differences with the NEMA one are one, this external sensor, which Zaga doesn't address, at least book 20 doesn't address. Um, and it's really more just a, if you're bringing in a, a, a sensor from the outside, uh, how you do it. Um, and then the other one is this, this unique shape. So I think there's actually a lot of complementary work been done. Um, my experience with both organizations there was a lot of communication um, and where possible. So I think there is a lot of alignment. It just, it's in the small details and makes it look not aligned. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that was a very short panel session, I'm afraid, but we have reached our uh, time slot. And there was so much uh, content, so, so much rich information coming out of your presentations. I thought it was really, really interesting. And I'd like to thank you all uh, very much for this uh, panel session and your presentations as well. So thank you for now. Thank you, Annette. Um, so we're going to take um, a quick break now before we uh, continue with the second session and the keynote speaker. Uh, and the second session will be on circular economy lighting and pioneering use cases. So look forward to hearing that later on. And I'm going to say goodbye to you now, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the program.